The documentary American Factory unapologetically presented views of how cultural exchanges with roots in corporate expansion or mergers causes disruptions at both personal and social levels. Hear how I, an American national living abroad, feels about how the documentary exposed the trend of global capitalism from China. You listen to Four Seeds, One Family. Welcome to Four Seas One Family, where expats, immigrants, and migrants can share and learn about life experiences abroad. I'm your host, James Thomas, coming to you from Taipei, Taiwan, and I'm so, so glad to have you traveling along with me on this journey, and welcome to the show. Now, as you may already know, constantly complaining about our cultural differences doesn't help to find solutions if those who are complaining aren't willing to stand up to help solve the problems they are complaining about. I hope that what I say can be used to mend the differences between the parties I'll be talking about. Because recently, I've come across a documentary that shows that in some places, people aren't aware of how certain cross-cultural exchanges that aren't purely cultural has having an impact that is invisible, suitable, or valuable at a particular location and its people at a certain time. Now, this isn't to say that all exchanges that aren't precisely targeted on furthering cultural understandings as having negative impacts or side effects on the place and its people, and saying so would be dishonest or simply a lie. This also isn't to say that people who are in need of the assistance offered as a result of cultural exchanges or interactions can't benefit from non-cultural exchanges and saying so would be also dishonest and a lie. What I hope to share with you is what I see as an example of how the purpose of cross-cultural interactions that aren't solely based on honest cultural understandings and exchanges can bring with them unforeseen elements that could be disruptive to the relationship between all parties involved. I'll also present to you my personal observations that show that the parties I'll be mentioning, along with their lack of understanding, self-centered motives, and misaligned expectations of each other, share responsibility for the faults they have encountered. Now, I'm afraid that This will become a global trend that will most likely continue into the future, repeating the same mistakes over and over again. Now, this is what brings me to the documentary, American Factory. Now, currently, there are a number of videos online that do a very good job at reviewing this fine documentary. This documentary was created by filmmakers whom I feel really care about creating stories that resonate with people, start dialogues, and causes them to think. Uh, The movie, this documentary, was also partnered with former U.S. President Obama's production company, Higher Ground Productions. Now, before... I continue. I would personally like to thank the Fuyao Group and, the C- and its CEO, Tao De Wang, for allowing the filmmakers to record events relatively transparently. Now, American Factory focused on how a successful global Chinese auto glass maker came to the U.S. in 2013 to investigate the possibility of restarting and retooling of closed GM auto plant near Dayton, Ohio. The movie mapped out how the Chinese auto glass maker managed and restarted the plant, as well as the struggles laid off American GM workers faced upon closing of the plant in 2008, when over 10,000 factory and related jobs were lost. Now, the Chinese auto glass maker, Fuyao, in January 2014, publicly announced that they were behind the restarting of the factory to produce car windshields. Now, remember, Fuyao produces around 70% of the auto glass for the consumer market worldwide, so they're very big. Now, 
I hope you can understand that I'm not purposely planning to give an outline, a synopsis, or spoilers of this fine film. What I hope to do is offer my thoughts on some of the film's content and its underlying connotations I detected that were presented deeply within the film. Also, as an African-American who has been given the opportunity to be educated partly in mainland China, I would like to share with you elements I discovered in the film that may have just flew by the eyes and ears of many viewers in both America and China. Now, elements presented in the film from both the American and Chinese perspectives were full of deeply hidden nuances that were based on their misguided perceptions of each other, which in most cases weren't very professional, much of which exposed their true feelings, which didn't paint a flattening picture of each other. After acquiring the GM assembly line and hiring local workers, the Chinese owner and management felt it would be a good idea to send some of the American management team to China to observe the company's corporate culture with the hope that by showing these American managers how things are done in China, they could transfer the Chinese company's culture upon their American plant workers in America. Now, although the American management team did find their trip to China eye-opening, most of what was learned simply couldn't be applied upon the American plant workers. Impressing upon the American workers the Chinese corporate ways of doing things was shown to be not even remotely possible. At one point, an American involved in plant management was recorded speaking in Mandarin Chinese to a Chinese co-worker and said that American workers were lazy and he wished that he could tape their mouths shut. To be honest, this American's comments to his Chinese co-workers disturbed me. Not because from his point of view and situation, this may, this may be true, but because he wasn't aware of the impact his words would have on the deepening of some of his Chinese co-workers' stereotypes of Americans working under their management. In any case, his comments just flew over his Chinese co-worker's head because his Chinese co co-worker began to question if taping the mouths of workers or, or even, was even allowed in America. Now, maybe this American manager felt that by saying what he did, it would allow the Chinese co-worker to feel that they were of the same cloth. However, in reality, his words only deepened many of the stereotypes the Chinese co-worker may have had of about even him. Now, keep in mind that in the minds of the Chinese managers, Americans were spoiled and in need of being pampered. And in the eyes of the American workers, the Chinese were only, they only cared about profit over their safety. Now, what I want to express at this point is that neither way of thinking was absolutely correct, but it does allow for looking to the hearts and minds of the people involved it becomes even easier to see the gap that stands between them. These tensions even, well, they even displayed a spice of nationalism. Now, I'm not trying to play up the stress and bitterness held by both sides or promote xenophobia. The simple fact is not all Chinese are hardworking and not all Americans are lazy. It became clear that the Chinese management became less interested in converting or building bonds with their American co-workers. In fact, the powers in charge had plans to replace most of the American workers with machinery after the factory became profitable. Things really hit the fan when some of the American workers started a movement that was in favor of forming a workers' union, which Fuliao from the very start was this were not in favor of. The American workers could not comprehend why their Chinese employer wasn't willing to offer them assurances. Tensions multiplied on both sides exponentially. 
with the weakening of power of unions today, unions and representatives had very little chances of success. And when, with the help of the Labor Relations Institute and unrealistic expectations and hidden motives, Fu Yao managed to crush all attempts to form a workers' union and later found ways to fire a number of the American managers along with some workers for issues related to their um, work performance, some of which, which may have been conjured up. At this point, it becomes easy to speculate from the very start. The original plan was to first get the factory restarted and profitable to the point where they could later replace the, the, local, American man, the, the local American management team and the workers and just replace the workers with machinery, which would allow for a faster and more precise, precise production. Now, this could be the point where I start focusing on conspiracy theories that say that the Chinese harbor plans to disrupt American control or influence at home and abroad. I'm not going to add to the gambit of views that, that propagate this belief. However, I am going to ask my few American uh, friends, both locally and abroad, to take the time to look and, and around and see how they see the world today. Most of my American friends back home do not feel the need to learn about how other people in the world live, and honestly, there may be some obstacles that prevent them from doing so. The truth is, large international companies from all over the world work this way. Many workers who do manual or labor-intensive jobs will be replaced by machinery or artificial intelligence. The majority of American workers are in a state of denial and are unwilling to or unable to make adjustments to their lives to respond or to reposition themselves to take advantage of new opportunities and advancements. They need to be properly informed to Get ready for this monumental financial and social disruption. The strange thing for me is being able to understand other languages because it allows for an interpretation of an unlimited amount of hidden connotations. And I'm using the word understand, not learn, for a reason. Learning words in another language can be fun, but understanding how terms are used in certain situ situations allows for an understanding of the people who speak it on a psychological level. Being able to interpret the cadence used by the Chinese management team when they were speaking Mandarin Chinese brought with it how they really felt about the events taking place in the factory and the American workers as well. Some of which was said by the Chinese management team in Mandarin about the Americans, American workers weren't flattering. Companies all over the world are trying to expand their influence and reach into all areas of localization and production. This brings up the need to adapt quickly to not only market forces, but also the ever-changing occurrences developing within emerging markets, and the competition is fierce. And keep in mind that with the influx of companies coming from China, that in many cases import workers directly from China in large numbers, there will not only be an increase in the numbers of Chinatowns in the U.S., but also, most likely in the near future, create a formation of Chinese states within the states. Now, what we are really seeing here is the example of sweatshop capitalism, a Chinese manager can be heard clearly mentioning that machinery at a certain time will be replacing a certain amount of workers. In the beginning, Fu Yao gave the American workers hope in the future. But in reality, they were just buying time to later have the workers replaced by machinery. This is very little to do with the clash of cultures. It is directly related to how profit is put over people's lives. This exposes clearly how disingenuous the owner and his management team were by giving his American workers a chance, a future, to later have them demoted or even replaced. Most 
if not any of the workers will be retained to operate or maintain the machines replacing them. Now, at this point, don't kid yourself by saying that this is just the, the Chinese ways it, way of doing things. Companies from China aren't the only ones that do this to, people's, to people in the time of desperation when they are hoping to climb out of their social or financial, financial predicament. The hardest pill to swallow is that Western nations are just now becoming aware of how situations like these, like those presented in the documentary American Factory, may later occur in their own country as well. Those of us who are living in comfortable environments should take a moment to look around at the luxury we possessed around us that may have been manufactured in places like China. Take a look at the televisions we watch, the clothes we wear, the cell phones we use. Yes, take a moment to think about the conditions workers in places like China were under to produce these products. I'm sure they weren't up to Western standards. Workers in China and other nations are also going to have to face the fact that one day they too may be replaced by machinery. And when this happens, the ripple effect will be felt everywhere. Please leave a comment below if you have found anything you would like to say or share concerning this topic. And if you have found what we have to offer of any value, please click on the subscribe and bell buttons below to help us spread the word that we have a lot more in common than we think. We're very interested to hear what you have to say. For Four Seas One Family, I'm James Thomas in Taipei, Taiwan. And remember to take care wherever you are.